Can we invite the Prime Minister here? here? Let's get one thing very, very clear. When J.K. Rowling approached the Northern American Prize on the Bajo Kuhn Medical Committee to obtain these kinds of information, these kinds of communities never once gave the consent for J.K. Rowling to utilize the kinds of methods, utilize the kinds of medical yeah. practices. But let's go in further. Like, let's, let's explore these kinds of communities as a whole. Right? The kinds of magical practices that we see occurring right now, right now appearing in J.K. Rowling's books and stories are magical practices that these people hold extremely dear. Right? Even more so than their guys. These are the things that are extremely sacred to these kinds of people. Things like resurrection stories. Things like burying their dead and then reviving like other people, like resurrection stuff, right? Are extremely, extremely important to especially the modern tribes. Right? We talk about skinwalkers, we're talking about mythical creatures as such. These are the kinds of evil spirits that these kinds of tribes actually did face and actually did fight centuries and centuries ago, right? These are the kinds of evil entities that these kinds of people base their entire lives on trying to defend their tribe from. Okay? So we think that the entire premise of J.K. Rowling's stories is not able to just fictionalize the kinds of, of, of culture that people once and you are know. J.K. Rowling also trivialized the kinds of terrors that these tribes once faced oh. in those dark times when they genuinely did believe that those kinds of mythical creatures didn't exist. When these, when, 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 these, when, when these tribes actually did everything that they could in their power to push for their own practices, right? Uh -huh. But let's move on to the case proper, right? Our case for today is very simple. We believe that J.K. Rowling's ability to use these kinds of things in massive, massive popular fiction is extremely harmful because it not only, fict uh, only fictionalizes these kinds of practices, it also is something that these people never once consented to do and it's essentially a hijack of their culture and entirely crowds out the possibility of these kinds of people to come up in the future to then lay claim over these kinds of rights. I have two arguments for the house today. First, it is hijacks the cultural narrative and secondly, why is it hard for these minorities to then lay claim over these rights after J.K. Rowling has done its screen a series. Firstly, how this hijacks cultural narrative oh, and crowding out. Mr. Speaker, we think that Navajo tribes actually have a problem with, it, with, with J.K. Rowling's screenings and this is during an interview so it's actually kind of true because it obscures their political Right. We think that these kinds of communities always have uh, are always able to lay claim to certain things. For example, like countries like Singapore when they're able to lay claim to Singapore so over certain kinds of heritage monuments okay. that they think is theirs, right? So we think that these kinds of tribes are no different and their cultures are no different. Yeah, sure, it's, it may not be you know physically manifested, but it's still something that they hold very dear and it's still something that they wish to own as their own, right? We think that the, right now the current kinds of practices when Jenny Rowling goes in so far as to use you know, the marginal tribes kinds of magical practices as a selling point for her new series, we think the commercial interception of these kinds of cultures is something that's extremely abhorrent. Why is this so? Because we think that these Navajo tribes never once consented to having their, 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 their cultures as a commercial selling point. They never, never, they never once wanted to profit from these kinds of things. Because we think in all, if, if, if they were that thought yeah, and the mere idea of them being able to profit from these kind of things actually goes against the very age old century and uh, centuries old cultures and traditions that their forefathers once fought so hard for, right? When their forefathers once lived in those dark ages for, they are sure they did not have that kind of you know general knowledge of these kind of things. But these are the kinds of things that they generally believe in. And this kind of, and, and I think this is exactly why the current incarnation of these kinds of tribes so fiercely protect these kinds of things. Because these kinds of things are essentially their lineage, right? Or what their fathers and forefathers once fought for. But more than that, right? We think the things like skin water and sugar covers, all, all these kinds of things should never ever be meant as a certain point, right? Because it sends a message that this culture is something that needs to be pushed for. We think these Navajo tribes never ever wanted this kind of subjective action in the very first place. Because they never ever wanted their tribes to come forth into the public sphere in the very first place. They wanted their magical uh, magical communities to stay in secret because they understood that these are the kinds of things that only their tribes had the ability to defend the world against, right? We think that these are the kinds of things that these kinds of tribes never wanted anyone else to do. Because the, 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 the reason is very, very simple, right? Because it's something so traditional and they completely disregard the rest of what the rest of the world thinks. We don't think that they actually want the world's opinion on what they think, right? Yes. Um, are you guys also willing to defend the, the normal publication of female genital mutilation, which is a culture in like, Africa, like very traditional? Yeah. Well, if they do give their consent and they're okay with these kinds of things going out in public, and we think if they still have some form of control over the kinds right. of narratives that are being spread out, unlike J.K. Rowling's case, where she completely hijacks something without the kinds of consent in terms of these, then yeah, we think it's fine if they do the consent article to control the narrative that they want, right? No. So second argument, how this is hard for minorities then to lay claim over these kinds of things. We think that the current incarnation of these kinds of magical creatures, magical spheres and communities, right, of the Navajo community 
tribes. It's something that these kinds of people in this tribe can never ever identify with anymore, right? So if you draw like, a projected screen for these tribes and show them the kinds of movies that J.K. Rowling uses of like, like uses of their magical stuff, right? They will never be able to recognize it. They will never be able to identify with it. And then you lie to them and tell them this is a incarnation. This is one of the old things of your tradition. You think that's a complete insult to these kinds of people, and that's exactly why they want to go into secrecy because they understand that the world will never be able to empathize and never be able to recognize the kinds of practices and age-old traditions that they must practice, right? We think this is an insult to them as people as well as their forefathers when they fought so hard for the sense of traditions to conquer they fought. But more than that, right, we think that this fractures indigenous tribes as a whole. Why is this the case? Because when J.K. Rowling Ron- uses her massive popularity to sell kinds of Native American magical communities, this then lays- gives the assumption to the rest of the population out there that thinks that Native Americans are nothing more than magical weirdos, right, who know nothing else about Na- Native American cultures, right? We think this is completely wrong, right, because these kinds of magical communities are only a fraction of what a Native American culture truly is about, right? So we think that the kinds of narrative pushed for by J.K. Rowling is one that is extremely inclusive towards the o- only the magical community, and it spreads the mis- the misrepresentation that these Native Americans are nothing more than magical weirdos, right? But more than that, right, we tell you that beyond the sphere of these kinds of magical fluff, we think that at a very, very fundamental level, these individuals and these people on these tribes never consented to these kinds of things being spread out. They never consented to the kinds of incarnations that were that were built, represented on the widescreen today. We argue that the ability for J.K. Rowling to spread this over a large amount of us of people is is directly going against the very principles of the Bible and the Native American magical communities, where they explicitly say in the interview with J.K. Rowling that they did not want their kinds of magical practices and their kinds of magical communities to be linked out to the rest of the world. They wanted to remain inclusive as in secret. The reason being that they didn't want the rest of the world to understand what they're trying to do. That. They never wanted the rest of the world to reconcile with them because they understood that the kinds of practices they had were only ones that they could they themselves could uphold and they themselves could only protect the world in their eyes, right? So we don't think this is J.K. Rowling's activities was something that's very important. But to some of my points, speaker, the real fact that J.K. Rowling is going in so far as to use this as a selling point for her new for her new series is extremely important, right? Because we think these individuals and these communities never once consented to having their communities prior or, or, or modified and sold as a and, and sold the price tag, right? We think these kind of things are priceless to these kinds of individuals and doing so is a direct insult to their cultures as well as them in, in a lot of aspects. So for all these reasons, we are extremely proud to stand for government. <laughs> which match on site government because they they say there's absolutely no consent but they propagate a world where these individuals hold these these people from these cultures hold their culture so dearly to their heart so they would never have an incentive to consent because they hold it so dearly to their heart there would never be an incentive for them to like to provide a factual to the world to provide a counter narrative to existing preconceptions about what that tribe actually is we think this is even more harmful right and i'll talk to you about it um, within four arguments uh, like four years in the conflict in the city. I'm going to talk about exposure and why exposure will never exist on their side. I'll, I'll talk about why the profitizing that this franchise makes off of the cultures of these individuals are, are good, right? Because they can be redistributed back to the people. I'll talk about assimilation and why their side, like, like creates the dilution of this culture because without any like exposure, without people understanding what that culture is, they will have to assimilate into the majority culture in Western culture, and that's much more worse. And lastly, we have a we have a discussion about the discourse that. But first, some response to the So let's talk about this idea of culture. We think, sit down, we think that like there are lots of cultures that where you don't ascertain consent before before like parts of that culture are reported on or, or stories are told about it. That doesn't make it any more important, right? So we think like like in where people don't consent to like we hold this we uh, we respect the integrity of these people and their cultures, right? So, where there is a story that is extremely important, maybe we, we blank out the names and we make these individuals anonymous, right? But we always tell the essence of that story. Like, we always say, like, we, we always tell the essence of that story. Like, female genital mutilation, for example, right? 
Because we think it's important to tell other people about it, right? We think it's important to raise awareness because that means we can pay attention to issues in those areas. That means we can distribute like resources and wealth in order to like correcting things that or correcting things that, that are wrong, right? With yeah. those societies. But even if we are never able to consent and uh, we are never able to establish consent, and that's something that's wrong, right? We think what we think let's look at these individuals in and of themselves, right? We think we will always never be able to ascertain the, the people in those areas will never be able to ascertain the impact of what they of, of, of giving their consent, right? Because let's look at these cultures like, like the Navajo tribes, for example, right? They are small cultures, they are rural cultures. The the, the world in which their culture extends to is that their, their community in and of itself. So they are unlikely to ever give out that information to other people, right? Because if they hold it so dear to their heart, why would they ever like they will always live in fear that, that it would be appropriate, yeah. right? So that means if that information never comes out, they make that own individual value judgment that we, that that means we can never get any of the other benefits that people have. So we think that um, we think that's really bad. So side government has to prove why consent is an absolute good in this debate. We don't think there was sufficient oh, yes. uh, explanation of that. Um, okay, let's Why is exclusion that's been good either? Okay, yeah. Um, the uh, the argument will come. Second like response because they say like you lose ownership. Firstly, like the obvious thing you say is like, and he considered to right. They they still physically own these monuments. They still physically own like parts of this culture. But secondly, loss of ownership is so much more worse on your side, right? Because when the culture is contained to these small areas, that means as 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 the culture goes on, right? As it dilutes over time, and there's no exposure, and it's only in that like, one area. As these individuals go out of those areas, right? They need to assimilate to majority culture in order to like, access benefits. They need to like like maybe dye their hair or change their eye color or. Or, or no, not wear tribal sides, right? In order to not be, uh, in order to not be like racially profiled, for example, or to be looked at as, as, as like weirdos or cannibals from from this area of the world, right? And we think that's extremely harmful. So if you want to talk about ownership, we think you lose ownership too when there is no exposure. But lastly, on this idea of trivialization, because we don't think. J.K. Rowling and the Harry Potter franchise misrepresents these cultures. We think, in, like, we think, the, the, like the resurrection for the mythical creatures are true parts of that culture, right? We think what J.K. Rowling does, like, and, and what J.K. Rowling has never been okay with, is misrepresenting and providing a caricature or a mockery of that culture. And we think that's extremely important to remember. Sit down. So, like, let's talk about exposure first and understanding that, like, J.K. Rowling has always utilized her position of outreach and her position of, like, like the 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 popularity of her own series to like to reach in and to, to provide exposure to extremely important social causes. That's why she made yeah. Albus Dumbledore a homosexual character, right? And we think because of that she was able to harness a lot of yeah. social support. Sit down, I'm not saying uh, she was able to harness a lot of social support and exposure and, and she was able to, to because of the like the mass outreach of that series, able to change a lot of norms or at least minimize the harm of it, right? So we think so what does this mean? We think what happens now, right, is that now we're able to provide some kind of like powerful counter narrative to whitewashing that exists in society right now. So we are now able to be we are now able to better change the effect of like of like um, the white supreme narrative, right? That there are also other rich, beautiful cultures that exist. That like at the very least, when people get exposure about that, that's something like the, the, we minimize the harm to some extent. Even if they want to say like people who go on Pottermore are extremely niche areas of like are, are people who are like extremely niche, right? Because they're only like the, the true like hardcore Harry Potter fans. We think to some extent that exposure still exists. We think there is some platform, for example, for for, for people to like come up with like spin-off ideas. People write fan fiction, right? People like people like like harness on that information and they create it in and of itself and they take poetic license. And we think that's something that's extremely important. What about profitizing? The next thing I want to talk about, right? Because we do recognize that the franchise will profit to some extent, right? But we think like the important part is that we like we're now able to redistribute that to the culture. We're able to rebuild and preserve these monuments, and that's extremely important because these cultures, right, are from an extremely like rural part of, of these countries, right. We think their suffering or, or their poverty or whatever they experience is extremely isolated, right. Uh, like for example, when the movie The Green Inferno came out, that like, we drew a lot of attention to the African native cannibal tribes. We were able to provide more infrastructure for them, more funding for them. More than that, it creates incentive for people who never would have heard about. These cultures to begin with, to enter, right? To to to, to like if, if they're interested in it, to enter and to be able to harness, to be able to harness the benefit of that. Let's talk about yeah. Let's talk about lastly about this idea about discussion. We think right now people are much more likely to talk about it. You debate, you get angry, that kind of thing. We think otherwise, you would exist in a vacuum, and there would be no discussion that happens. 
you know, at all. And we think that's a world that's so much more worse. Because, like, yeah, we think that's a world that's, that's so much more worse. At least on our side, we have some kind of discussion, some kind of impact. But lastly, right, we think you provide some kind of empowerment to these people. These people who otherwise would be seen as, like, like weird rural people who practice witchcraft and, and, and like, cannibalism and, and those weird sort of rituals, right? You provide some kind of empowerment to them. You provide some kind of spotlight that frames it as, like, a beautiful, magical thing that people are interested in. And we think that's so much more important on our side. For all of these reasons, give this debate to the the speaker Edo was pretty strong, right? She's like to use words like we think this is important. We think some other things are important. Like who exactly is she? Because the last I checked. People still own vastly important rights and concepts which may have value addition in other parts like education, but we still don't make that a mandatory because we recognize that people still have ownership about the other things that matter. That's why it's very important when I uh, like Darren drew the parallel to you. Tell you how individuals or nations often have ownership over certain artifacts in the same way we still recognize things like IP rights and people still can own those things. But with that response to us, it doesn't matter, people still own that product. It matters more when people own that product because they cannot lay claim to that culture because you overcrowd the ability of these people to access that culture when other people with more political clout, where who has like more social space, more airtime, super duper fame, in like posters everywhere, are able to use and accentuate the kinds of misrepresentations in the worst kind of ways possible. I will extend in two things. I will tell you why is it that individuals have a natural incentive to do the kind of misrepresentations in the most obscure and most dangerous way to hurt individuals. Therefore, this clashes directly with the idea that people are going to do this super in the most like, positive light and be a best structure. The second thing I'm going to extend on is I'm going to tell you why, how this leads to a commodification of culture and hurts assimilation. So thankfully, she brought up the point of assimilation that also deals with that argument. But let's deal with the other things she said. The first thing Regina says, was people ought to be able to know of this culture, and this is important. Above and beyond just the fact that we don't think like exposure is an all-important good in every overriding circumstances, we also think it's uniquely dangerous, but the particular exposure is oftentimes controlled by individuals in power. Why is this important? Because oftentimes the discussions that exist is not always on equal footing. It's not a discussion of me being across Regina on a table and having seven minutes to talk on equal space. Oftentimes these discussions is dominated by rich individuals and influential people like the kind of white individuals that they came was so like beneficial in spreading these words against these kind of individuals who don't have the kind of representation to exist. Oftentimes the exposure and discourse that they claim were important is uniquely bad because there's a dis like it's disproportionate because it's often controlled by individuals in power. The reason even more than that why this is problematic is because individuals in power, like film directors, who oftentimes already have a track record of not being inclusive, that's why we barely see black actors winning Oscar and things like that, are the worst kind of ways in which you want to garner discourse. Because even if discourse can happen, which is their best case scenario, what is the catalyst for change in any of these paradigms that exist? Because even if discourse exists, there's never going to be a fillet for change that is going to happen. So even if we take their best case scenario that discourse existed, it exists for the worst. Second thing she said, was we need to redistribute this profit. Okay, like, what happens if I don't want the profit and I go like, I want to be alone, I don't want your profit and I don't want the fame, I don't want people to know about me. Like, we think that's an equally valid claim, right? We're not really sure what people must know about you, right? We think it's equally important if these individuals want to say that like, I don't want individuals to know about my culture. And this is not something novel, right? Oftentimes we see the aboriginals in Australia, in Australia and Havana who don't want to have political representation even though they were offered. Why is this important? Because oftentimes they just don't think that the state structure or the modern way of life is instrumental or important to them. They have every right to reject that kind of way of life and say I just want to settle in my rural settlement in this particular setting because those things matter more to me. It's not like, it's not until recently where we even give political enfranchisement to things like the Maoris. What we suggest is if the Maoris didn't want this political enfranchisement, that's an equally valid choice. You can offer, can we do this, if people say no, maybe just suck it up. 
The next thing they said was we need assimilation and have discourse. Two responses specifically. One, people don't go like, ah, we found out about paganism. Good thing, let's promote your culture. People go like, you are a weirdo and you are an outcast and now you fill the echo chamber because more people know about it and more people can ostracize and dismantle the kind of ability for these people to hold on to their culture. So more people knowing is more dangerous in the perspective of these individuals from this culture and we think that actually genius. But second, let's just take those obscure UI of female Three responses. First, if society has progressed to a state where the vast majority of nations think that that is illegal, we can have a discussion on that without you reaping commercial profits from it. Meaning to say, you can say, people are doing this. This can be bad. Let's stop. You don't have to say, let's portray this with fairies and wizards and wands. We think discussion can be made in the most factual manner and we think that's exclusive on our side. Two so, extensions, no facts. First extension, why do you think, yes, actually, I'll give you. So what does your side do about all of the people who have to assimilate Western culture because there, there is a dilution of that, that tribal culture? You should lift my second extension, no next to you. So I'm not going to take anything. First, right, let's talk about why this is bad. Because how individuals portray that culture is often not the way that they claim them to be. The only way we can get the most amount of capital benefits or get any sort of profit is selective commercializing. How does this happen in the like most of the majority of it? In prison of Azkaban, the mentors were not like cool black things that people can see from. They were like they were based on a Greek art, like like based on a Greek culture where the aboriginals in Greece think and have a conception that these people were child snatchers. These are the kinds of narratives that like J.K. Rowling stole from these individuals, selectively portraying it to make them cool so that children can subscribe to this. We don't necessarily think, see this as a value good. But what happens when you selectively, uh, selectively commercialize this is you crowd out the ability for other people to lay claim to their culture. So if she wants to talk about assimilation, we'd rather a world in which if these individuals really want to promote this culture, these people should do it by themselves and not through the help of J.K. Rowling. We think that can still exist on our side. But more importantly, we think that the genesis of culture became important only at the point where individuals want to have like cultural appropriation and we think this is exactly what they were going to do. So if she claims people are going to spin off, that's the definition of like cultural appropriation. Everything that's just extremely bad. Let's talk about the second idea, right? Because on the like on the uh, like on, on the basic level, we think assimilation happens better when people own that narrative and own the ability to tell the, like the stories of their culture. We don't think you have better assimilation when you hijack that experience and have that discussion in the most lopsided way to serve commercial interest. But here's the best case. Like, if you don't want to assimilate, don't assimilate at all. If people want to be closet permanent, we let them be the way they are. Very proud of the folks. I'd like to have a question for this speech. I'd love to see my video here. I'm going to talk about two issues in my speech. My rebuttals to a side of opening government will be integrated. But before that, let's look at what they talked about. So like the largest contention was basically individuals kind of consented to that um, because like it's your culture, you know, you should be allowed to take ownership of that and like how you cause greater harm, especially since people don't want to be there. To answer these questions, to answer these like, these, like arguments, I, I will, let's move on to my first issue first. Do people own these products and all cultures and does this model affect them? Mr. Speaker, we do think that these people take ownership of this culture. We think that it is not true for you to say that the point in which where J.K. Rowling enters your sphere and like bright store, like chooses to, to feature your culture within a publication, you automatically lose ownership of your culture. Rather, we think the converse happens. We think people, especially within these instances, are more than likely to be able to be more like to take ownership greater of their culture. Why is this so? Under the side of opening government or like government in general, 
the context is that people's perception towards Native Americans or people's perception towards these individuals of these minority races are already there. But the problem is that in order for you to have any kind of meaningful discussions to happen on your model, you need to have your consent. But your consent will never happen, especially since you recognize that these people would never want to allow their culture to be placed upon them in the open sphere. So how can you then change the stigma that happens within your model as well? Because you can't tell me that people don't stigmatize individuals of these resources. So we think that we, you, we, like we think that in order for you to then argue that these people do no longer have ownership of their culture, you need to then provide a alternative to, to, like, uh, like to respond to the stigma that happens under your model. So on a scale, it's far more likely that people do understand these cultures. Because recognizing the people that do read Potter more are the people that just don't, like the people are, are just not enough of Harry Potter, right? So you enter the website, you want to, this, 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 like, you want to see which house you're sort of into, you follow the adventures after that, no thanks. So it is more than likely that these people will not take these cultures like me. So your point about you ostracizing them will not happen. This means that you create a greater awareness or you create a greater incentive for people to actually understand why J.K. Rowling yeah. did do these certain things. So like for example, when she did reveal that in her books it was talking about AIDS and HIV, you did allow people to actually invest more in my more research in terms of looking why that was so. So also when you have like when you have movies that did depict like the like the cultures they didn't surround, for example, the headhunter cultures where Charlie Theron start in that, you did have individuals that actively tried to understand those cultures. No thanks. We think your ownership is far greater. But we think in the worst case, we remove your consent when your culture, at least when I deal like this, when I deal with them at their best, right? We remove your consent of your like you remove your consent when your culture affects people, especially people who do want to opt out. So like this is a positive about intergenerational moderation, no thanks. So for example, in Mauritia, where you force where they force feed women to be sold off to wealthy men. In Syria, where they castrate young boys in order to be sold off as dancers. In Sarawak, where you hate hunt those that enter your villages in order to ward off evil spirits. No thanks. All these things, Mrs. Speaker, have already been adopted by Western cultures in order to tell people that these things will happen. So your counter proposal or your, your alternative that you said talked about, like that objective discussion, isn't doesn't really exist because you need the consent for that as well. This means that in order for greater potential of these people, especially people that do want to opt out, we think it's far greater under our model. Because recognizing that consent existed only within those ancestors, right? So these ancestors were the ones that adopted these cultures. These ancestors were the ones, like the fathers and mothers were the ones that wanted to be a part of these cultures. But these children who were born within these instances were forced to assimilate themselves within these cultures. So at your best, we think we cater to that. That's why we see instances where people actively try to break up from racial enclaves. No thanks. That's why we see instances where people actively try to break up from like the Aboriginal indigenous tribes in order to make a stand for themselves. We think that you make it far less likely than these people would be able to be better off under your model, especially since you no longer want to engage in any kind of meaningful discussion in order to engage properly with that. No thanks. We think the comparison is simple. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, there will be people that are unhappy. Unfortunately, there will be people that feel that you are antagonizing and you're garnering profit or they get nothing. But we think that the trade-off is far greater. When you have women in Africa that are genitally mutilated in order for you to preserve your culture, we think that that's abhorrent. Sometimes cultures change. It changes when people choose to change that. It also changes when people are willing to engage in more meaningful discussions. We think that, that just like the old, old testament, right, where it's okay for you to for you to store with it, it always changes according to adapt to what society feels is relevant. In order to make that happen, we need to allow this. We, we don't regret like J.K. Rowling's like stance in this. I'll take a closer. Uh, notice that most of Rowling's social causes are often white-centric, things like anti or like homosexuality. When it comes to instances where she like portrays the French students in blue batons, she's willing to portray them as being either exotic or being positive. Yeah, yeah, like your comparison is that you no longer have that discussion whatsoever. So on a scale, right, we'd rather that. So unfortunately, some kind of some kind of whitewashing 
would happen because Jacob Lodi is inherently white herself. But unfortunately, but we think that this on a scale is far better. So comparison to your model, where you have mute silence, we think it's far greater to allow people to be aware that these indigenous cultures within Native America and their Salem Lodi and six, where their, their Salem traditions and practices are not as pernicious as they say. Which leads me secondly to my second question. Why is this model beneficial? We think the preconception that people have towards these Salem traditions and like how they executed women for being witches and how people like 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 like, like pretty, pretty depicted you know not the Navajo cultures to be violent and aggressive changes. Why? We think that in every J.K. Rowling's publication, there is always a story. Right? There is always a protagonist that embodies that culture. Within these instances, it is always J.K. Rowling's incentive in order to create and to make that culture at its best form. Like sure, it may be because of profit, it may be because of sell, but J.K. Rowling isn't that dumb as well. She is not likely to create a, a narrative that actively persecutes her. That's why she chose to wrote things that are more like, like liberal in, in order to cater to the society at large. We think that the, the kind of discussion and assimilation happens at the point in which where people now are able to identify with those characters within those books. They can now say that ah, it's no longer about Harry Potter and Hermione, but it's about my culture. It's about my ability to identify with these books. We feel that it is important to allow these people to be proud of their cultures. Unfortunately, some people will be unhappy. But isn't that status quo? Well, see, she's extensions a whole lot of context. J.K. Rowling's already written seven books. She's unlikely to write any more main novels. The rest of these exotic books are written with footnotes and will remain footnotes even if I really want to read more about the Eastern or the African schools of mystical thought. They will literally be fantastic creatures and where to find them. At the point where these other worlds will never be as richly developed as the Potter world of the British Isles, two impressionable young children on Pottermore who worship J.K. Rowling's worldview, they will think it is okay to have a world where the bulk of history, narrative, and the best practice are all predominantly culturally white and where, Ar where Agrabah and Yamato will never get their own seven book series. So yes, kids will hear about these other cultures, but they will hear them in context of a white-centric, white-dominated world, and they will only accept a very unfairly white stilted version of what it means to be truly international. Mr. Speaker, we put it to you, this is cultural imperialism dressed up in an invisibility cloak, and we never stand for that kind of thing. Right, I first want to go through a lot of rebuttal before moving on to my ginormous single extension on how this cultural imperialism affects the way we see other people. The first thing we say, it's impossible to consent in all cases. Yeah, look, the Navajos will never give out the information we acknowledge that, but we're okay if not letting them give it out. Why? We forced them off their lands, we killed all the totem bison animals, we dug up the bricks and put them to work as casino owners, and now we want to make money off their sacred animals. If a culture wants to lift the stigma, given all we did in the past, we are very happy to leave them alone because we bloody well should. Right. Second argument they say that these cultures will be otherwise forced to assimilate on the white man's terms. It's true that we can't stop that cultures may die over time organically, but the important thing is to allow these people to do so on their own terms as individuals. We don't drag their kicking and screaming to our white dominated centric discourse as a footnote on a website to a white canon or a free website where people cheer and change the way they see people from Japan or China as footnote because you must be a wizard from the other school which is not Hogwarts, uh, therefore you must be not as important as me. At the point where that kind of assimilation is done on uneven grounds, we rather not assimilate if we can help it. Alright, so third argument, that of uh, our advocacy. Over here we get this really interesting tension in the OO case. Let me talk about it a little bit. Colin already said with a pure eye that a lot of the causes that J.K. Rowling talks about are predominantly like white feminist causes. When she describes the Middle Eastern school in Pottermore as segregating the male and female students, she ignores the fact that some women in the Middle East might find this okay, that the concept of what a good woman means may differ from culture to culture. So the, pine, the kind of arguments on advocacy she brings up sound like a very white man murder kind of argument where most people who read Pottermore might become a very racially superior interpretation of what good policies are. Let's look at the way the case evolves. Regina said they want to protect culture and tradition through increased exposure. Abel says at his second and his fourth minute in the speech says that he wants to shed light on practices um, like female genital mutilation in these countries and liberate young people who never consented into it. 
So clearly, they're not really interested in protecting the old culture, they're quite happy with destroying some parts of it, which is a problem. The last time we saw this kind of discourse enter the modern world, we colonized South Africa. And I don't need to talk about how often that kind of thing is. So even if we want to change these cultural practices and push better policy, we need a more nuanced cultural understanding of these policies in the public consciousness by Amnesty International or CNN, not with something which is so fantastical, so simplified and diverse in reality, it scars over a lot of nuanced understandings of the way people live their lives. Right, extension material at 3.30. Now, I first, the way I'm going to do this extension is by showing you who J.K. Rowling is and what her consensus are. They're going to talk about the cultural value nuance of Pottermore as it is, and then I'll show you what actually happens when people absorb this kind of diet. So, first, who's J.K. Rowling? Well, she's one white woman, she made the decision to put in these cultures by themselves, and she gets all the profits from it. So a lot of these things that um, options where they reach through the wealth are things that would be nice if they happen, but so far I don't think of it happening at all. So she's never asked these people, she never signed a contract, she never gave them a plan for using money. It's very presumptuous and self-serving. Why is this particularly harmful? Because unlike the other cultures, <coughs> She can always discard her culture like a cloak. She's not what she's not Middle Eastern, she's not Chinese. But people who are affected by her writings, which she makes profit of, cannot discard their skin. They have to live with the stereotypes that other people paint for them. The egotism of the literary elite, at least the 99 percent is that culture, these things like your values, these things like your history, are big, they're not intellectual property. I don't need to ask you first. They use the excuse of creativity to hijack your own cultures, as OG said, okay. to make it um, something for their own consumption and diet. And we think this culture in literature and publications is something that we stand fully against. Because we do think that maybe creativity shouldn't be an a priori good, that people should be consulted on what they consent to put out in the public world. Now, second exception. <coughs> the portal world is not actually culturally sure. neutral. Yeah. Um, I recognize that there are instances like in status quo, people do stigmatize like Native Americans and things like that. Why do you think <coughs> on your level, it's more beneficial that individuals do scout your own preconception, like without like the ability to have to engage in a kind of counter discourse that happens? If I think that the cultural narrative of what uh, North Americans are enters the media discourse on their own terms, it's starting to be more representative. In that point, the engagement becomes a lot more fair and a lot more representative. I'm not going to stand for a world where engagement must be done at all costs, especially not when it bites into a majority white narrative. So I'm not taking the burden on. Now, the portal world, one slide. The portal world, surprise, surprise, is not culturally neutral. It's actually culturally very British. And British witchcraft is often associated with traditions of Wicca and Druidism, which is to say they are not value neutral to begin with. What this means is therefore two cases. Because number one, even if there's public exposure of this kind of culture, because of the sheer weight of literary background behind the seven books in the canon, other cultures will be subordinated as footnotes because there just isn't much material on them. And even where there is information is often simplified. In book four of Goblet of Fire, the French are portrayed as demure and robotic, the Russians are portrayed as brooding and drunk. So at the point where J.K. Rowling has a track record of representing people correctly, I'm like, aha, no, she doesn't. And the idea is that these stereotypes enter the consciousness and are absorbed by these young kids who go no otherwise with the to think that this is okay. They think the whole world's culture revolves around white culture. They actively host the fact they think it's cool, or they find themselves wishing they are not Chinese because I want to be Hermione even though I'm Chinese bread. Or they write fanfics and oh my god, God forbid they ever should write fanfics. Or they make bad Hollywood movies and like Journey to the West or Ghost in the Shell, where they play these cultural narratives into a white dominated world and therefore cast Sun Muko and uh, the main lead actress as white people. This is where a lot of this whitewashing starts. It's insidious, it's unnoticeable, but it definitely is there. And in the worst case scenario, some of the cultures represented of Pottermore don't actually consent. Because the Middle Eastern schools of Sufism that she tries to represent actually see Rika and Harry Potter as witchcraft, which is to be represented in their world, it's actually an element of their own cultures. So we do think there's a heavy problem when we let literati like her get away from Buddhism, get away from white privilege, to represent people on terms they never once consented to, making money off their backs and misrepresenting the canon of world history. We are very proud of this. Thank you. In today's world, what we're missing out on, what we're missing today, is representation and inclusiveness of other cultures. And we think so, but let me quote that. They talk about white centric. We believe that.
that on our side we'll be able to break the meat we'll be able to break the strip that the media will like you can only be successful if you write about white people and and we and we want to break that the thing that says that like like basically we want to have more representation so it isn't so much white centric white centric but before I go on to that but oh wait sorry so what side opening talked about was how these uh, cultures how these tribes can be assimilated or accepted now but what side closing is going to do we're going to take a step back and look at how significant inclusiveness of other cultures is in Harry and in especially Harry Potter and the series. But before I go there, let me start with a few rebuttals, right? So the first thing is side uh, closing government talked about is that how that we only hear from white centric people and how it's so bad. Firstly, sit down. Please be realistic. Let's be honest. Like, like the reason why is like. Like, the reason why it's white centric right now is because there's very little representation. So, by limiting representation of other cultures, aren't you then now propagating the white centric thing? But not only that, because the reason why it's white, like, we think that, we think that what you want is for these tribal people to speak out for themselves. But it is very hard in a white centric world. And it's even worse on your side because you're not trying to help them at all. Trying to break, like, trying to help them take away the white centric, uh, Motion. We think that what you're doing is, we think that we we don't see a problem with spreading it through white centric views because, like, we don't think J.K. Rowling is saying stuff like all oh, these people are terrible. They are saying stuff like showing the culture of these things. No, wait, sit down. And not only that, like, the like we believe that it's much better to spread awareness with whites, like true white media, because that's the most significant media today in today's world and where most people and. Where most people can relate to, because most people really like, like it's much easier for people to relate to this chart or to understand this chart if it's written by one person. But not only that, it's a significant because it shows that these white people care about these tribes, that they're willing to insert them into their books. And and that's the thing. Sec okay, second thing, how about, about profit? Look, like we don't care. Okay, no consent. Like whether profit thing or not, we don't care because we see that in today's world, many people. And many artists are profiting anyway. Like for example, Conjuring, they didn't have consent to to like talk to talk about that haunted house, or whatever. But they still do, and it happens all the time. So that's why we don't we don't see this as a major issue in debate. So now this now to talk about my, my extension, which is how we believe that we need for more representation. Yes. A lot of your opposition's material hinges on getting some sort of representation, but you never understood the nuance of this debate, which is why people actively don't want to. Look, we see that, like number one, even if they don't want to, we're fine with it because we don't see we don't see you guys bringing us a real harm of it. So what is their commercialize? We think that other than that notion, they'll be able to get respected for what they do more, and they'll be able to people will be able to recognize them more. And that's where, like for example, if we write about indigenous people, they'll be able to get the rights. Like like if because people recognize them, so people are more likely to like fight for them if necessary. So anyway, back to my extension. Because we see in today's world, there are barely any representation and we think that that's a very bad thing. Because if you look at Harry Potter's world, like it is read by so many people around the world, not just in Europe. So that's why we believe that we should include other people as well. We should include other, uh, we should include other uh, cultures because there are many people from the cultures as well. And it's not fair for them to be left out towards this, to be left out in the book as, it, as and we think that the second thing is that we we want to show we, we think that what we don't sit down we think that when J, like when JK Rowling does this she's setting a precedent she's setting an example because we see that Harry Potter's books are very successful so that means even if she wrote about this she'll be successful and we think that when what this shows towards writers like other writers like who might not be as famous or whatever is that that not only like you don't only get hit like you I mean sorry you don't only manage to sell your books if you write about white people. You show that you can sell your books writing about other cultures as well. And we think that that's very significant. And I'll tell you why now. Because there's a social norm today that it's all, like you can only write about white people. But we think that once, once, uh, once more people start to feel that you can write about other things and they start writing, we think that that's a very good thing. Because now you erase the notion that other cultures don't have a place in Western books. You show that they do have a place in them and they are able to sell and that they're interesting. And like we think that's we think that's very we think that that is very
very important because we live in 2016 now. We are progressing. And we think that what we need is to step, is to actually break the stereotype that only white folks can sell and actually show that and actually show that why cultures are so important and why we must appreciate culture. And we, we and we think Harry Potter actually does a very good thing in shining a positive light on these cultures by showing that all these cultures, they have met like they're part of this, they have magic as well. They're not the ones set out to decide, they're not isolated, they are part of the wizarding world. And we think that that's important to show that how cultures are not of a set like not separate identity, not someone you like you should just look upon, but actually part of the world. But not only that, why Harry Potter? Because we believe Harry Potter is read by a lot of children, and children are very impressionable people. Impressionable people, and we, who, who, which is the time where they get educated, where we, where it, it's the time where they need to get educated, and we see that, and we see that this is the this is the way we get them educated by show by introducing them to a world where that's that where that's that not only white people are important are the main characters, but other cultures also play a part in both, and we think that that's actually a very good impression on children. So because we think that if they grow up in this circumstances, they'll be more accepting towards other cultures and less because we believe they'll be accepting because then they won't see them as oh like who are you or like what are you, but actually someone that they recognize. And second thing, we believe that children learn easier, like why books? It's because children learn easier with this kind of entertainment. No, no child is going to learn by a bunch of facts on cultures. No. We believe that in order to educate people, you need to do it interestingly. And even though it's not 100% accurate, we believe that this is still some form of awareness and still some form of education. And that's why side closing opposition supports it and you should. And yeah. I think Four questions I'll be answering in this debate. Firstly, what this debate is about. Secondly, is Rowling the best person to propagate these cultures? Third, are these signaling effects really justified? And lastly, which helps the minority within obscure communities break out? First question, what is this debate about? This debate ostensibly may be about the exposing some kind of culture. But you must understand, Mr. Speaker, that it involves subordinating other cultures or the new cultures under a literary footnote. Because whatever happens, Rowling is not going to write seven new books on like a place in Zambia or a place in Harlem. We think that ultimately speaking, or whatever happens, is going to be subsidiary to the adventures of the very British Harry, Hermione, and Ron that happened in her Magnus, in her seven original seven Magnus opus. We think that under these instances, if it's about representation, it's one that necessarily excludes the, uh, the, the full robustness of a certain culture and often victimizes or exoticizes them in an amusing fashion. Much like how, when in, in the original ontology, when we talk about Algeria, it's often either A, a place which is very low on crime because it's where Voldemort can hide, or B, it's a place where the brooding Victor Crumb can live, or C, it's a place where his classmate who loves alcohol gets turned down by his, 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 by his master in Dunstrom in, in the, the book for of that particular book. These are the sort of misrepresentation that Rowling is prone to do in the first place. And you're making her, and you think it's just fine in this particular debate to allow her to have more leeway to expand on that universe in that kind of white narrative? Go. Is it much better to get some form of representation, even if it's misrepresentation, than no representation at all? Like, when you're talking, 
when you misrepresent something, it's like bullying. It's like me telling you that you are a faggot and the whole class laughing at it. You don't get a chance to talk about it. You don't get a chance to engage on that kind of that, that misrepresentation. But ultimately speaking, the very fact that I talk about you doesn't necessarily mean that I'm giving you credence. So is Rowling really, really the best person to propagate these cultures? No, she's not going to give any of the proceeds of her book back to those institutions, right? That's not going to happen. She's also not the sort of person who you expect to be able to fight for these causes. And this is what we extended particularly for closing government, that she's the person who would advocate for gay rights. She will be the person who will tell you that Dumbledore is gay. But when it no longer comes into a, a notion of what white centric social causes are, she's the person who will, who will say that let's reimagine the Harlem, the Salem witch trials from my which is yeah, consensually recognized historically to be something that was ultimately bad for America's history, to one in which you cannot conceivably realize to be acceptable because people because people were burned, but perhaps they were burned because they were really witches and they managed to get away with it. It's a kind of romanticizing the thoughts of horrible historical instances in the past so, that the info so, slide has already yeah. reflected, which we think is particularly pernicious to her worldview, particularly as an individual and an individual who doesn't want to delegate the Pottermore universe to other subsidiary writers, much like how Game of Thrones would. So we think are the signaling effects done justified? We think that the effects on children isn't that they become educated. They become educated to bash these minority cultures, to say that these minority cultures are footnote in that literary history. We put to you, coming from Lucas specifically, that that kind of signaling effect is one that's particularly pernicious given that Given that, granted, these children are very susceptible and do see them, do see this as a figure of fun. At the point, no, thank you. I'll take opening a bit. At the point in which you are unable to control the narrative that children have, and the point in which you are able to engage these children with the actual culture, then they are not really learning. There is no ontology of books out there that talk about Nigerian or Nigerian tribe history that they can refer to to further their exposure. This is quite unlike perhaps Rowling poking fun of the Spanish or the Bulgarians or the Irish because at least under those instances, it's very easy for these children to reach out to their French friends or their Spanish friends to at least clarify these misconceptions. So we spoke to you in conclusion that's particularly harmful if she misrepresents these particular kinds of inaccessible communities. But let's talk about lastly the minority uh, uh, on which chapter minority within these communities break up. Because that was huge. The, the, the argument that came up from opening as particularly at DPF, was that it was necessary to a certain extent to allow these minorities, to allow certain people who didn't like their tribes to break out their community. Let's break down the problem, right? We don't think the problem is about the community being unable to access a certain culture or having a particularly bad culture. Because in civilized and uncivilized communities alike, homophobic cultures and homophobic communities do exist. We think the real problem with that is about the ability to have the resources to bring out, to have enough money to migrate to another community in which there are less homophobes to that particular community. We think that the kinds of policies that you need are those that don't necessarily need to change the way we view a particular culture, right? Because what we do currently in the status quo is that we give things like tax rebates to casinos owned by minority or tribal groups, and we do things like compensation to uh, tribal groups, much like how Australia is compensating the aborigine communities. The reason why we need to stick to those policies and not recolor the way that these cultures work is ultimately because we want to treat them as individuals. At no point do we want these voters to say that these people are exotic, are exotic and not, do not deserve the same standards than the average individual do. What Rowling may potentially do in the instance uh, that you have no kind of representation is that, uh, oh boy. Yeah, so like, the world that we live in is heavily dominated by white-centric discussions and your minority people will never be part of the discussion. So why is it better that continuing to the stigma, you want to leave, you want these people to forever no longer be their culture? Because the real counterfactual is that you get to write your own narrative. Much like how you write your colonial uh, 
books about your own colonial history. We, did, we thought that was kind of obvious on the ground. And the point which your, your narrative is being dominated by J.K. Rowling instead of Arun Dutty Roy, who can go on to win Nobel Prizes for writing the girl of small things, we think it's particularly important that we keep that option open rather than misrepresenting from day one and conflate that bullying with exposure. But we, what we put to you coming from closing was that when you whitewash these things, you're also whitewashing the momentum that helps these minorities gain the kinds of resources for individuals in the community to move around and have access to the kinds of happiness that you want. We put to you that the kind of exposure that you got on the ground was highly independent or a highly crucial one, or dependent on the idea of being able to control your own narrative, but more importantly, by preventing J.K. Rowling from propagating her white book white feminist views. Misrepresentation is better than no representation at all. Okay, so in today's debate, I, uh, to finish this today's debate, I'm going to be answering four questions. One, which side uh, better removes white centric narratives? Number two, uh, should white people be allowed to write about other cultures? Number three, um, is, is humanization a bad thing and is it actually happening? And number three, and number four, is commercialization actually bad? Okay, so on the matter of which side better removes white centric narratives? Okay, so Okay, we concede to the fact that sometimes misrepresentation happens in J.K. Rowling's books, but we would also believe that it is an unfair assumption to believe that every single representation of J.K. Rowling's uh, J.K. Rowling makes about uh, any other cultures is a misrepresentation and represents them as like lower or as not as good as white cultures. We believe that this does not necessarily happen in every single example that she gives in all of her books. Sure, okay, we consider the fact that she's never going to write eight books about Zambia or she's never going to write a trilogy about China, but she doesn't need to because we see that uh, any no, we sit down because we see that even one footnote is better than not having any footnotes at all. How so? Okay, so even if she writes about other cultures from a white centric viewpoint, what else do you propose? What is your counter narrative? Either A, you have no exposure, so the next, so no one knows that these cultures actually exist, and no one knows about these practices that actually are taking place. And so the next person that comes and writes around these people as savages is the first impression that these people, who most of their lives have been, like metaphorically lived under a rock and do not know much about other foreign cultures, that is the first representation they get of foreign cultures. We would rather them have it, like we would rather J.K. Rowling write uh, about that. We would rather write, uh, rather J.K. Rowling write about other cultures and risk uh, cultural appropriation, even uh, because at least there is some truth to it, and at least she can represent it in some way. Okay. Aside from that, do you propose um, then for people to write their own books about their own culture and to like propose a fully politically correct, a fully representative idea about their own culture? No, that's not gonna fly because okay. Because most of the because most people come up uh, growing up reading white centric novels, and most people grow up reading stuff that comes from a white centric viewpoint. So if you immediately bombard them with books and with TV shows that surround culture and that surround culture that comes from um, viewpoints that are completely different from their own, then they are not going to be able to relate to it. They are not going to understand it, and they are going to go through their life thinking that they should never bother trying to understand other cultures because they never will. So we see that J.K. Rowling just uh, coming up. Uh, coming up and at least exposing people to the idea that other cultures exist, that America is not the only country in the world, or that Britain is not, co not co uh, culturally superior to everyone else, then at least these people are then going to be more receptive to more uh, inclusive ideas. And we believe that this is a step that J.K. Rowling is taking in the right direction. Before that, uh, okay. Okay. Your side says that these books will be consumed by young, impressionable kiddos. Opening opposition says people will do extensive research. You expect the same kiddos that read your Harry Potter books to extensively research and have complicated discussions to help the assimilation of culture. How does that work? Uh, okay, so maybe they're not gonna immediately like read one footnote about Tanzania and go and do research about Tanzania's culture and like have extensive discussions. But at the very least, they are open to the idea that that 
there is that Tanzania does exist, and that now that they've read that it exists, hey, look, there's a book that's more inclusive about Tanzanian culture. I'm interested in this because I read, because uh, I've seen my relatable characters, which I have grown up with, um, interact with these uh, people that come from other cultures. So I want to find out more about this culture. I want to, uh, so I want to uh, read more books, and I want to have more discussions, and eventually I become more open-minded. And we do not see this process happening on your side because we see that you just. Uh, that you just do not want uh, any representation of foreign cultures if you believe that it's even in the slightest misrepresentation of the culture. And we do not believe that this is constructive and we do not believe that this will help in any way of stopping the white dominated um, narratives and the white dominated culture that is already so prevalent in today's society. Okay, so second question, should white people be allowed to write about other cultures? We believe absolutely yes. Because, okay, the motion in today's debate is this house regrets J.K. Rowling's use, uh, uh, J.K. Rowling's expansion of the public visiting world. Okay, we absolutely do not want to apologize for J.K. Rowling doing what she does. Because we see that the minute people, the government, and the minute we as a house go out and publicly apologize for perceived um, cultural appropriations, then it immediately becomes socially wrong, and it immediately becomes morally wrong for us to appropriate culture. But we see that even if this appropriation of culture uh, can sometimes be bad, we see that the minute, because most of the authors in today's uh, in today's society are white, and most of them come from a certain background, say from Britain or the US. But the minute you make it socially unacceptable for these writers with huge readerships to write about any other culture that is not their own, then, it immediately be, then you immediately close all the doors and you immediately make it unable for these people, uh, for uh, these people, for the only people who can make it relatable to white audiences, uh, like white audiences about uh, foreign cultures, you immediately make it non, um, you, immediately clo uh, you immediately remove any process of this happening. Now before I move on to my third question, yes. Uh, we also open more space for books like Kino, Aki, they write representatively about post-colonial African literature. What's so wrong about giving minorities their own voices and give them more space to those voices rather than white people to support their culture? Okay, we absolutely did not say that minorities cannot write about uh, their own culture. We we um, cite opposition loves the idea of minorities going out and representing on their own. Um, their own culture, but we see that it's unrealistic to expect that uh, cultural shifts and organic change can only happen if only one form of representative culture is shown to the world because we do not see any stepping stones from people who have grown up with white centric culture and people who have grown up with white centric narratives to now be more open to the idea of foreign cultures. Okay, before I run out of time, moving on to my third question uh, Is trivialization so bad? Okay, um, we could see that trivialization can happen. Yet we believe that if uh, the minute you uh, the minute you try and force young impressionable children to try and understand entire books worth of cultures, we do not see that as happening. So we see that if trivialization can happen, and if if trivialization means that uh, that culture is slowly diluted to a form in which people can be more responsive to it and people will be able to understand it better, then we see that trivialization is cannot necessarily be an absolute.